coming and to second for organizing this seminar and for inviting us to present our findings from our research. My name is Stefano De Rico. I'm wearing a couple of hats today. I am the Monitor Evaluation and Learning Lead of the, of the International Institute for Environment and Development, which is a think tank based in London. Um, and also I am the advocacy lead of the international network Eval SDGs, which is a, a network which is advocating for better and greater use of evaluation to achieve the sustainable development goals. So the title of the session is Evaluation, Follow-up and Review Processes of the SDG, Future Vision and Current Practice. Uh, well, hopefully future vision. For sure we talk about the current practice and actually I think the vision is more a discussion uh, between us. I know there is great expertise in the room, and I think, you know, hopefully by we'll have time towards the end of the session to really kind of unpack what it means to do a good evaluation for the SDGs. Um, so what I'm doing today is to presenting the findings of a couple of pieces of research that we have done in collaboration, IID and Eval SDGs, um, to basically see how evaluation has been used in the voluntary national review uh, that were submitted to the UN in the last couple of rounds. And these are reviews that are um, conducted by countries themselves and we'll go, we'll go through these findings and we'll go through the current practice. So this is an international collaboration, is in fact uh, a series that we have developed. Um, we have developed so far eight papers and uh, um, what we're trying to do is really to try to understand what it means to look at evaluation from an SDG's angle and therefore how the SDG's could inform and should inform the, evaluation, the evaluative practice on the one hand. On the other hand, we are also trying to understand what's going on in real life. So it's a kind of hopefully mix of both theory and practice and of course we don't claim to have the answers. What we're trying to do is more to create a community of practice. So, for example, as part of the, the network, which uh, um, I strongly encourage you to join and to kind of ask more if you are interested. W the network is made of uh, um, professionals working in MNE across different departments, from uh, governments to the UN to um, civil society organization, IID is a civil society organization, think tank, not so many from academia, so is, if any from you is working from universities and want to join, is very, very welcome. Uh, and, and we meet monthly, we uh, reflect on what's going on in different countries, uh, we have members really from all different continents. So it is in fact a, a very um, good group with a lot of intellectual energy. Um, the the uh, sixth paper has been funded by, um, mostly by SIDA and uh, um, Danida and Irish Aid, whereas the eighth, uh, uh, and also by the Finnish, whereas the eighth briefing has been funded by UNDP, so thanks to them actually we have been able to the UNDP Evaluation Office. So what we've done, we have analyzed all the 65 reviews which were submitted to the high-level political forums in 2016 and 2017. These were submitted by 64 countries because one country has uh, um, basically um, submitted twice. Um, one in 2016 and, tw and one in 2017. So it means that already there is somebody who is really committed and engaged to make this happen which is fantastic. Um, the first thing I would like to say is that the BNR, uh, though important, they are just one piece of the jigsaw. And um, so every country is meant to submit a national review to the HLPF. However, the 23rd agenda makes it very clear that uh, the most important action should happen at the country level. So this reporting exercise shouldn't just be um, a tick box exercise for the UN, for um, New York and Geneva, it, 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 it's just one part of the jigsaw and each country can decide when they want to submit, whether they want to submit more times within a specific time frame or not. Um, but, uh, uh, but yes, but the, what the Agenda 2030 is also saying very clearly is that there should be other um, activities happening in each country that should inform uh, local decision making. 
So, and I think you know, the interesting element as well to, to uh, an interesting word to highlight is accelerating the implementation of the SDGs. In the agenda, there is a clear focus on, on the role of evidence, not only evaluation, but also data and also uh, different type of, of reviews to improve and inform decision making on an ongoing basis. And I think this is also kind of uh, uh, interesting since we are here hosted by SECAN and um, in, in a world which is very complex, uh, uh, the importance of feedback loop is now recognized even in such a high profile agenda like uh, Agenda 2030. So as I said, the real change will happen only when reviews will be used locally. The VNR is just one piece of the jigsaw and possibly not the most interesting one because it's good to present the findings to the UN, but then how, you know, what, what is real happening? What is really happening? Is this, are these uh, evaluative conclusions and data used at the local level? Um, very strong focus on data and the collection of data. However, at the moment, um, we found that, you know, beyond that, it is very difficult to, uh, to go because um, there are a lot of uh, efforts to collect uh, new data and to improve statistics, which of course is really, really important, but at the same time, how are we going to use all this data? We can have plenty of data. Actually, we, you know, we are um, all living in a world full of data, but then how do we use them to make our analysis? That's really uh, something which is difficult to crack. And also, uh, without proper processes, um, the, the interpretation data could lead to inconsistent or conflicting findings. So if we don't have proper processes in place, such as evaluation processes, then it can be really difficult to, um, you know, this emphasis on data can, cannot Im improve, actually, the practice. So what we feel is the role of evaluation in these VNRs processes, and I'm talking, you know, on behalf of the Evan SDGs network here, we believe that the evaluation can serve Agenda 2030 by facilitating the co-generation of value judgment. And this, of course, must be based on varied sources of rigorous evidence. So not just quantitative, not just qualitative, it's a mix. But then, of course, how do we make sense of such a uh, wealthy amount of, uh, of information, or such big amount of information, in a way that it makes sense? How do we aggregate all this information up? at the national or global level? These are very big questions. Um, so again, big focus on processes. For us, it is important to recognize not only the value of developing information, but actually the value of having processes to handle this um, data. And what's the role of evaluators? Well, we believe that evaluators have a responsibility to challenge monopolies of problem definition of issue formulation, of data control, and of information utilization. This is, um, these are actually the words of Barry McDonald, uh, one of the evaluators actually from the UK who came up with democratic evaluation. And um, we believe this, uh, this is really our role, especially in the world of the SDGs, where the interactions between the different goals actually imply clashes between different uh, um, interests in many cases. For example, if we take you know, conservation policies and economic growth, there are clearly, in many cases, conflicting interests between the two. So how do we handle those interests in the process of value definition? And we believe that the, the role of evaluator is exactly that, to facilitate processes which enable to deal with these difficult um, process uh, with this difficult um, uh, call for, uh, for value judgment. So we must mediate different interests in the processes of value definition. This we think is the role of evaluators. Agenda 2030 is a massive set, step forward. And the main reason is that it recognizes the interrelationships between different goals, the trade-offs, not only the positive synergies between the different goals, um, and also the complexity of the real world. However, what has come up very soon and early in, uh, um, after the agenda has been signed off is that countries can be very easily um, feeling uh, the agenda as a big burden. I mean, they have to already do their own 
national and local uh, policies, and now they have to think how we, play, well, how we embed SD, the SDGs into our own priorities. They have to develop a new massive amount of data, which they weren't used to do before. So the whole thing can easily collapse if we don't find ways to handle the complexity of the agenda in itself. And um, <clears throat> one way to digest the agenda, we believe, is to develop simple messages around its key principles. Um, so these are what I believe are some of the kind of key messages coming out from Agenda 2030, country ownership. Um, very clear, for example, in the VNR, VNR process that the countries themselves should take the lead and use uh, the review processes um, to make the SDGs happen. The universality element, which weren't there with, uh, um, wasn't there with the MDGs, for example. Now the focus is much more on um, the world as a whole, and therefore it's not just about the, the developing countries. It is, in fact, um, about uh, all countries. And I have to say that the, for the universality element, is not this, this principle is not yet recognized, for example, by many developed countries, or at least is not fully appreciated, but we are getting there. Um, sustainability, so the MDGs had a much greater focus on the social element. The SDGs, the value of them is that they are trying to incorporate the, the environment aspect much more strongly into the agenda. Partnerships, and finally, no one left behind. So, this is assessment uh, that we have uh, conducted. We have published two papers, one uh, last year, and it was about the VNR submitted in 2016, and one this year actually just came out in January um, about the VNR submitted in 2017. It's been quite a massive exercise to look at all these papers, but we have worked uh, together a group of 14 different professionals from different parts of the world to analyze um, this report in a consistent way. And what we looked at specifically was how evaluation was used. So there is plenty of other research that could be done on this VNR, and in fact, fascinating documents. There is a question mark on how much they reflect the reality of what's going on in each country, of course, but there is also a wealth of information in there that can be um, used to see how the agenda is uh, effectively implemented in different countries. So what we found, well, let's start to say that in almost all national reports, it was not entirely clear how evaluation actually um, should be used. Um, countries, some countries have reported about using evaluation, but it was really ad hoc and, you know, in different uh, parts of the report, it wasn't uh, so systematic. Most of the countries uh, um, didn't have a clear idea or even didn't mention evaluation at all. And in, in many cases, evaluation was confused with monitoring. So it was almost the same thing. With, um, so this was a concerning findings in a sense, and I think a wake up call for the evaluation community as a whole, because um, <clears throat> of course we can't blame countries themselves uh, on uh, if they don't um, know how to use evaluation. There is also a reflection that we have to do ourselves on how well are we actually reaching out and are we uh, um, liaising and um, working within this framework. There appears to be very little awareness about just what evaluation is and how it could be used to support the 2030 agenda. So this was quite a strong statement we put out there. And um, Again, it's really difficult to understand how the evaluation could be used just for the reports. Um, most of the reports did have uh, a lot of uh, statistical information and data, but very little about evaluation and processes to reach conclusions. Yeah. So <clears throat> in terms of country ownership, uh, so I'm now going to present the findings uh, according to the kind of five key principles that I introduced before. Um, the first one, country ownership. The good news is that almost all the 64 reporting countries implemented the governance structure, so it was clear the governance structure that they put in place. Every country, of course, is establishing a different type of structure. Um, 
I think the most common is to have coordination bodies where there is one specific department or ministry within the government that is taking care of the implementation of the agenda, but within a coordination bodies that is liaising with others. In most of the countries, um, the uh, kind of leading role is played, I think 14 out of 64, um, is played by presidential and prime minister offices. In other countries, different kind of uh, ministries are um, taking the lead, the National Planning Ministry, the Environmental <laughs> Ministry, the Budget and Finance Ministry, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs were the one recurring the most. At the same time, those who really deal with monitoring and evaluation, in most of the cases are the offices, the National Bureau of Statistics, that are either uh, taking the formal lead within these coordination bodies or are in fact heavily involved in developing the voluntary national review reports. Um, but again, very little mention of evaluative bodies or um, ME departments within different countries. Um, so Union Society, how are we doing? Well, I have to say, we are doing better since I started to present these findings last year because <laughs> last year we didn't, we actually we didn't have, uh, there are some countries that are missing, as you can see. And uh, um, the others that were missing were South Africa and uh, uh, Australia. And they have both committed to report, uh, I think both in 2019, which is a great thing. We still have some big countries which, um, let's say, they haven't, they haven't yet communicated uh, intention to report. These are USA, the UK, and Russia. I believe the UK, they said they will, uh, they will um, submit a report, and I think the plan is to submit in 2019, but I've checked the list on the uh, UN website, and it lo doesn't look like they've done the um, announcement yet. But anyway, um, there is an issue. Some countries haven't yet committed even. They have to report at least once every five, five years, but they haven't committed to, to do it yet. Um, however, there are some countries which are reporting more than once in four years. For example, Benin, Qatar, Uruguay, Colombia, Egypt, Mexico, Switzerland, and Togo. Togo three times. They really like the agenda, actually. Um, and, and it is actually uh, comforting because and many of these countries, they do have some good evaluative practices in place. For example, Colombia and Mexico are usually, um, uh, are usually uh, known to be very good at monitoring evaluation. They've got structures in place to do m and &E, um, at the um, national and local level. So, so this is the situation. And of course, I mean, it is interesting that all the developed countries, you know, the missing ones, are in fact developed countries rather than developing ones. So there is a question on who, who is evaluating themselves. So, sustainability. Sustainability, we found some very good things. Um, as we said, the voluntary reports, and this is also clear in the guidelines that were recently approved by the General Assembly and the, Secretari the UN Secretariat, they should look at the interconnectedness. So it's not just about looking at the achievements in each goal. They should look actually at trade-offs and positive synergies. It is there. It's, uh, it's a clear. The problem is that when you are reporting only stats, then how do you look at the different interconnectedness? It becomes really complicated if you don't have processes in place to look at these things holistically as uh, um, you know some good practices to evaluate complexities, um, say. But the good thing is that in almost all countries, uh, um, they have conducted or are planning to conduct a gap analysis to see the type of data that um, they are missing to report against all the 17 goals, which is great. And some countries, like the European countries, they did this process before as part of the uh, Rio 2020, 2020 process, but um, many countries, especially the developing one, it's the first time that they're doing this exercise. So it's great that the SDGs are pushing towards this direction because we are going to have more stats and we are going to have more information about all the different aspects, not just a few ones. Of course, the issue there is at what expenses because if you know, there is this big emphasis on 
developing new statistics, then the efforts will go to develop data, but there might be you know, less emphasis on uh, developing good ways of analyzing the data. So you know, there is always that kind of trade-off which needs to be thought of. Um, partnerships. Many of the 64 countries have implemented special committees to consult, guide, or oversee the SDGs. Um, and these institutions do include usually civil societies, um, uh, private stakeholders, uh, uh, the, the parliaments. So they are usually, or they are said to be inclusive. Of course, then we have to, you know, what we don't know is the extent to which those processes were really inclusive in practice. Again, a big caveat, we were looking at the reports and what was said in the reports, we didn't check and we didn't evaluate what happened in reality. We heard different stories from different countries. In some countries, yes, they were. In others, you know, there were uh, some organizations say, well, what was written in the report wasn't really what happened in reality. So, you know, there is a question mark there. But, um, but at least the intention is there. And again, it's a clear commitment from the agenda. It is one of those messages where we can really, which we can really use to make sure that participatory processes are happening. No one left behind. So the no one left behind, again, whenever we ask, you know, how are we going to do this? You know, how are we going to look at inequality and no one left behind principles within the agenda? And somebody raised their hand say, well, we have to disaggregate data more and more. And in fact, is what is written down in the agenda. But the big issue there is that, in reality, the more you disaggregate the data, the more they become unreliable. Because you can, you know, they, they, they eventually they don't add up. The, the complexity, of course, becomes greater when you disaggregate the data. And therefore, what we are saying here is that it is key to use also other forms of data, not just disaggregation. Disaggregation, of course, is important and it is key. But in most cases, disaggregation stops at the level of gender, for example. Um, already, if we go into the level of disability, it becomes trickier. So to make really sense of what's going on in terms of um, inequality, in many countries, we have to look also at other types of information, which could be qualitative. They could be also, for example, GIS mapping. And um, you know, there is some great work done by Slum Dwellers International to map all their slums, um, also using uh, um, cameras on balloon to check you know, how big the slums are and, um, and uh, how many people are living there. So what we're saying is that, you know, we are in 2018, we have to go beyond the usual kind of stats, household survey, uh, with, uh, you know, usual type of disaggregated data. We can use more information also because the challenges ahead are greater. And therefore, in many countries, it's really difficult to use only those tools. Um, also to say, like, uh, agencies like UNICEF, which have been done this kind of, you know, surveys international. For a long time, they are also reporting a lot of challenges, especially when it comes to tracking the most marginalized population. So if we want to understand those type of population, we have to be creative in terms of using as many data as possible. So these are kind of, I, I talked more about the bad news, but we, in purpose, we try to look at the good <coughs> news and to try to find some good examples which we could point towards to encourage uh, you know, the new set of reporting countries next year and also to encourage the UN to foster good practices. Because the point I'm trying to stress here is that we don't have an answer. The answer is coming from the different practices around the globe. And, um, and by looking at the different practices, then we can you know, find um, what works better in different contexts. So for example, in Nepal, um, in Nepal, there are several actually things going on in terms of evaluation. And the National Parliamentarian Forum has developed a five-year integrated action plan as part of, of which they will develop a, uh, an evaluation policies by July 2018. Also, they have this par uh, Parliamentarian Forum on evaluation, which will analyze the findings from evaluation to inform policy and practice. Of course, there are question marks around the quality of the findings of evaluation in systems where you know, evaluation practices are not established. But these are great steps that can help um, to improve uh, decision making. Indonesia has presented clear evaluation guidelines. 
Afghanistan put significant emphasis on multi-stakeholder approaches to review the SDGs, whereas the Maldives intends to use data triangulation by, by cross-referring qualitative and quantitative data in reporting against the SDGs. Europe, um, and I have to say that the evaluative practice is mostly lacking from reports uh, coming from Europe and Asia, whereas there is much more in reports coming from Africa and Latin America. Czech Republic they stresses that monitoring must be accompanied by evaluation to address the complexity of the SDGs, so this got new good news for um, SECAN and those working on complexity. Uh, Cyprus mentions a few cases of evaluation in the education sector that have been used for program adaptation and improvement. Portugal stresses that indicators per se cannot be the driving force of development and actually we have to look at the causes and effects and the links between programs and effects. In Sweden, the municipality of Marpo has adopted the SDGs as their own goal and they are looking at the interconnections between the three pillars of sustainable development to develop, um, the, uh, to assess the long-term investments. Very good, some very good practices coming from Africa, actually. In Kenya, they've used a review of the MDGs to inform the SDGs and to inform their national um, sustainable development plan for the SDGs. And the, the VNR has been validated through uh, stakeholder processes. There is actually a stakeholder forum on the SDGs, including different stakeholders. And, uh, and also, um, they are willing to tap into potential of new and non-traditional data sources to complement statistics. Also, Kenya is one of the few processes, uh, of the few places which, um, where we have seen uh, integrating the SDGs also at the local level. So they make it, or at least they make it very clear that they want to do it. So they want to, um, to, uh, to, to embed the SDGs into the new constitutional structures which foresees um, having a much more decentralized um, system, basically. Botswana highlighted the need of multi-sectoral involvement in the development of the reporting and national indicator system. And Ethiopia is conducting a national review on their performance against the MDGs, which is informing the SDGs as much as Kenya. Again, um, they are using uh, evaluation to inform the way forward. Some good examples from Latin America, actually I have to say that Latin America has been surely the most um, countries from Latin America are the ones that have reflected the most on the role of evaluation for the SDGs. Again, it doesn't mean that the, val the actual evaluative practice is better in, in, you know, in these countries, but at least their commitment for the SDGs looks stronger in the report they have submitted. Uh, so, for example, Costa Rica acknowledges the importance of evaluation in terms of policy review, effectiveness, efficiency, and accountability. Guatemala is planning to conduct periodic reviews that should be carried out at national, regional, and local levels. Belize VNR is utilized evaluation findings in the assessment of the current situation in relation to cash transfer programs, whereas Panama has established a multidimensional approach to measure welfare, poverty, and discrimination segregation, which requires the adoption and adaptation of policies, monitoring and evaluation mechanisms, which recognize the complexity of the SDGs. So as much as, you know, the example from Sweden. So these, we believe, are all good examples we, ca we can draw from to um, to improve the practice um, and to, to learn uh, from each other experiences. So we have come up, being a group of evaluators, we couldn't resist to come up with uh, recommendations as well. Uh, so we have recommended that the US Secretariat and the General Assembly should indeed look at the guidelines again um, and make it much more clear how to use evaluation. Countries themselves have spoken with some representative from Guatemala that are implementing the agenda, I mean, are in the kind of at the center of the agenda implementation. What they said were, was, well, you can't really blame us on how to use evaluation. We, we are not clear. I mean, there was anywhere written down that we should use evaluation um, in the guidelines we received. 
uh, so we can't really blame that. Although evaluation is mentioned a few times in the agenda 2030 itself. So we are saying we believe they should, in fact, um, look at the guidelines again. And in this process, engage uh, those who have the expertise. So for example, the UN Evaluation Group, but also, and I would say most importantly, the uh, civil society. Uh, there are a lot of uh, civil society, uh, I mean, evaluation societies and association around the globe, uh, 108 actually, they are all under this umbrella called the International Organization for Cooperation in Evaluation, and there is a great uh, amount of expertise there, so they should uh, contribute to the revision of these guidelines. The countries submitting the VNR, um, they should uh, engage with evaluators. They have engaged a lot with statistical offices, which again is great, we need the stats, but uh, the story doesn't end there. Also, evaluators should be in this process to develop the report. Otherwise, we will have just a bunch of statistics that we'll have to uh, decide how to interpret. So, for example, in many countries there are uh, voluntary organization for professional evaluations that could be engaged. Um, academia as well and, and universities where um, there are courses in evaluation should be part or could be part of these processes. So we believe it's really important that they, they reach out. At the same time, the evaluation community can just stand, stand there and say, well, they haven't engaged us, this agenda is not going to work, which is, you know, we are always a bit the, the kind of, um, <clears throat> that kind of attitude doesn't help. So what we are stressing is the importance for evaluators themselves to understand what mechanisms are in each country for reporting and how they could engage with these uh, mechanisms. So for example, there are different coordination bodies, um, which ministry is in charge of reporting for the MNR, how and at what point the evaluators should get engaged to improve these national processes, when, also very simply, when each country is reporting and wh how, how are they planning to use the different evaluations done uh, at different level in each country. So we are really stressing the importance for VOPE, which of course are voluntary and that's the main challenge, to engage with these processes. And then finally, we believe that evaluation capacities and use is in fact uh, in great need of uh, um, greater resources in a sense of support, but not only support, also uh, courageous will. That's, those are the words that we use, because you must be courageous and you know, brave to use evaluation to say, okay, let's you know, assess and uh, um, use critical thinking to see how we can inform future practice, not only to look at the positive side, but also to look at what is not working and how we could improve. Um, so, in terms of the f content, um, we believe that we should make clear that macro indicators have limits. Um, the MDGs, if we look at the MDGs, global indicators, we could believe that everything was perfect in the last years. We know that from evaluative practice, different things have come up. For example, if we take the you know, indicators around access to education, they look great because access has increased, but in many countries, what, for example, evaluation from DFID have shown was that uh, increased access means having 100 or 200 kids in one room. Of course, you're increasing access, the extent to which you're increasing quality is a question mark. Because, you know, so there were really ways to assess whether quality has improved or not in terms of education. So these global indicators, sometimes also people refer them as kind of sausages. They are kind of nice and to taste and see, but you don't really want to know what's inside. <laughs> so, so yes, so they are good, but again, um, uh, also looking at other type of data. Complement the focus on quantitative indicators with more qualitative methodologies, the guidelines, for example, the ones put out by <coughs> UNDP, they're really lacking on how. They're mentioning qualitative methodologies, but it's unclear how they could be used. So again, there should be greater understanding on how these could be used. Um, and uh, there should be a strong focus on building an interlinked picture. So a very important paper has been published by ICSU, 
and um, it's a guide on the different interactions of four these sp specific goals. I can send you references if you like. Uh, but the important uh, message there is that you know, they're looking systematically at the positive and negative interaction between different goals and what should be uh, bear in mind. So, yes, we believe these, uh, these are kind of the key improvements in terms of the content. Um, of course, assessing also causes and effects is, is, uh, is really important. In evaluation, we have come up with different methods from counterfactual to uh, you know, more qualitative <coughs> or case-based methods like process tracing to more, even more um, uh, sophisticated methods like agent-based modeling and so forth and so on. But the key point is we should look at the linkages uh, to learn. Um, we should pay attention to vulnerable population and the environment, so to both. Whenever I hear about you know, the SDGs from different agencies, if they're working with people, it's all about no one left behind. If they're working with the environment, it's all about, uh, um, of course, mother hurt. But you know, they're both important, and they come together. Um, and of course, you know, we, even we as IID, whenever we have a mandate, our mandate is sustainable development, is to work towards the mandate. But if we do that, we then fall in the same uh, mistakes we did for the MDGs because we, um, we forget the interconnectedness uh, between the different goals. And uh, we, uh, we believe it is important to assess the roles and responsibility of different stakeholders. So the big difference with the MDGs is that we are not asking, you know, we're not going to evaluate a bunch of countries which are receiving money for uh, implementing the MDGs. Here is about assessing the role played by all stakeholders in different countries. So in the UK itself, for example, how is the Agenda 2030 going in the UK? Um, we did a report, for example, where we, we uh, provided, sorry, oral evidence to uh, an inquiry made by the environmental, uh, environmental audit um, um, group of the UK Parliament, and, uh, and what came out from the assessment of different agencies and also from what's said by the National Bureau of Statistics is that there is an issue with inequality in this country. So it's going to raise, all the forecast is that the inequality is going to raise, and that is, of course, against the no one left behind principle. What do we do? So it's not just about assessing how developing countries are doing. It's about assessing you know, how we are doing um, as a whole. Um, yes, and this is the end. I, um, I think I would leave you know, the space now for questions and also um, it would be great to have a debate. So if you have found yourself in your current <laughs> practice, if you're doing evaluation, doing research, something different, it would be great to hear those, uh, those points. And also what you believe could be you know, the um, good evaluation for the SDGs, because the debate is open. Like uh, I just received you know, uh, an email from um, the director of the department of m and &E of a big uh, country in evaluation, and they themselves say, okay, so this report, you know, the, the briefing was great, but to be honest, how do we do this? Because they're not really clear. I'm not getting an answer. And I think, you know, nobody has an answer. We are just, you know, trying to open up a space for discussion. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Paddy Hi. from that, yes. Uh, perhaps a couple of questions just to clarify. You, you, you mentioned a couple of times this idea of using you know, alternative or other data sources. What, what sorts of data sources might you be referring to? You know, than the, non the usual statistics you said. So what's the other sort of data that so you came across in the, in the work? So for example, we know in the slums, just to report what it, so in the world, we have 2 billion people living in the slums, which is a massive amount. And in many cases, these people live in streets which don't even have you know, a name. Um, if we rely on household survey made by the governments, we never get a picture of what's going on. OK? 
Because if you live in the slums, your first worry is not to tell the right information to the government. Okay? Because you could be evicted, for example. Um, so we can't use that data. We have to use something else. Slumverse International is an organization we work with. They have come up with this um, um, community-driven data collection exercises across the globe to map the slums. And in this case, are the slum dwellers themselves that map the slums. There is a lot of documentation, a lot of, um, you know, I mean, it's a very well-documented practice. I can send you the link if you like. Um, and they use very uh, reliable uh, statistics because they have methods to validate the information they collect. And even they have come up with methods to validate collection globally. So they do this exercise in a lot of different communities. Um, I don't have the, the right figure in mind, but they're talking about thousands of communities and 700 cities. And, uh, and, and, uh, and for example, they use this information to challenge the idea of the poverty line. Because the poverty line came up being very different from 1.75, uh, which is what is used today. Um, but actually, they, they, and they also guess the national poverty line. Because in the slums, they have much greater costs, which are not factored in mm -hmm. when they calculate the poverty line. So this is just one example. But the way they do it, for example, is to using satellite information by just you know, putting cameras on balloon. Um, and, and then your question could be also, why are they doing this? They are doing this because they've realized that if they get more data, more information, they can actually sit with the local authorities to negotiate. Um, better, uh, la uh, better conditions in the slums. But this is one example. There are many. So, you know, we, are, we live in a world where everybody is producing data. Why should we just stop at household survey? So it, it just, you know, uh, I mean, the kind of, if we want to take a kind of more trivial example, but um, the Twitter, um, you know, um, the Twitter hashtag me too, has produced a huge amount of new data. How reliable is that? Um, kind of are, are those type of data? We don't know, but we can. We have tools to, to assess also how much they should increase your confidence. I mean, we have Bayesian mm -hmm. updating and a, a lot of different tools. I mean, we can we can use more than a household survey. That's the point. Yes. Hi, um, Danny Gray from CAG Consultants. Hi. Um, We've just completed the project in London, trying to monitor um, progress towards sustainable development in London, London through a series of indicators of the London Sustainable Development Commission. Um, and so I had a couple of questions that kind of, kind of relate to that, because I know the, the London are looking at how they can link that work in the future to the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so one, one of our challenges in the work was the, the interdependency issue that you raised. You know, you've got a set of indicators, but actually how do you look at how these separate or separate indicators and issues relate to each other. So I wonder whether you could first of all highlight any good practices you've come across in, in your review of the, the BARs in, in looking at um, complexity and interdependencies between the different goals. And secondly, whether you've come across any good practice in terms of measuring um, progress towards the goals at a city level, uh, not just at a national level. Yes, well actually the two, the, the one practice which come to mind is the same, is the one, the municipality of Marmo where they've mentioned uh, you know, the use of the three pillars of sustainability to assess the long-term investments. So that's the main one at the city level which we have come across. Yeah, comes the municipality of Malmo. Malmo. Yes, in Sweden. Yeah. Um, and, and they use this kind of approach which looks at the, you know, social, environmental and economic aspects. Um, again, like, in terms of VNR, it is kind of new practice. So I'm sure next year will be we find much more. Uh, it's worth, you know, having a look at, at, at them. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the XU paper is the other paper I would strongly recommend. I can send a link. Because they have already mapped, it, they've mapped only four goals. And it took, them, it took them quite a long time to do that because there were a lot of different synergies. But I think it's a great um, starting point. Um, Yes, and also, of course, you know, practice, I uh, believe, from second would be useful. Yes. Um, when, if this national um, report, this national report, commentary national reporting is done by governments, um, 
have you noted noticed any challenges with with what they see as acceptable data? Because obviously they would have national data sets, which sometimes might present statistics in a particular way, um, whereas other other data might actually tell you slightly different stories, and therefore you start to create these sort of tensions in that. And I suppose that's where evaluation can play a role in building plus, you know, conf confidence in the data they're presenting. Will also then create a the challenge if that data is perhaps not telling quite the same story to the one they want to present. Uh, any experience from any of the reviews you did? Yes, I believe. Um, <clears throat> I believe also like the um, okay experiences are different from different countries. Uh, so the European countries are much. Uh, you know, they they present a lot of uh, statistics information in a very succinct way, uh, whereas the other countries like from <clears throat> for example, Latin America, they present much longer reports. Um, so, and of course, then there is a question mark. Well, they might, you know, different different national systems may be less or more reliable. I think there is plenty. Of, uh, so we didn't find a, a lot of practice where the governments themselves have uh, have used other type of data. To be honest, there is mention from Kenya to say we should use more data. They didn't mention using uh, uh, civil society data in any report, for example, civil society generated data. Uh, but there is room. I mean, it's a practice which can be improved. I believe that still countries see this as an exercise for the UN, unfortunately, most of the countries. There is also a lot of piecemeal information, in a sense, because what they do is probably is just, you know, the reality is that in many cases they need some information to put together for the report, and then they call, you know, the researcher doing fisheries uh, uh, somewhere in the capital city, and, you know, they ask them, okay, can you put together something that you have to submit to the report? So that's, you know, in many cases is the reality. But on the other hand, I think there is plenty of room for improving. I think there was a question over there. Yeah, so I wonder if you had seen any relationship between the, the quality of the evaluation and reporting and the actual kind of outcomes that are being achieved or progress is being made towards those. I think we, we hope for the better evaluation leads to better outcomes in the end, but I wonder if we start to see that. Well, we can't, no, we, we didn't, for two reasons. First one, because we looked specifically at how evaluation was used and not at the outcomes themselves, because we didn't have time otherwise. Um, but that would be a very interesting piece of work. And the second thing is also most of the reports are reporting about means of implementation, not about outcomes themselves. I mean, it's two years down the, down the line, so it's comprehensible, I think. Yes? Yeah, hi, Stuart from PwC. Um, we just published a report with the UN Global Compact and the Global Reporting Initiative looking at what business is doing on reporting its impacts on or contribution to SDGs. And I just wondered. For you, what do you think could or should be the role of business in this agenda, and, and specifically in measuring progress against SDGs? Yes. Um, well, I believe, you know, so in the European reports, there has been a lot of emphasis on businesses taking the agenda seriously. And we know there are a lot of, you know, there is a lot of commitment from big corporations as well, like Mars or Danone, or, you know, in taking the agenda, embedding the agenda. So, and there are important initiatives out there, like the Impact Management Project. Or, um, of course, you know everything is is uh, uh, is very welcome. I think, uh, and I think the, uh, definitely, if, bus if businesses and uh, you know the private sector take the agenda seriously, it means going to scale. It means that the, the change is going to happen at a massive scale. The question mark, of course, you know, is that the malicious could say, is this greenwashing or is or is real commitment to assess performance. I think that's the, you know, that's the key when we crack that point. And I think if, if business are serious and assess the linkages, also with trade-offs, for example, and uh, the negative synergies between, for example, economic growth and other things, then we can start looking at um, we're going to achieve great change. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing any of that from your perspective come, come through? Well, I think it's early, but I think it's um, there is uh, definitely the, there is a, a lot of uh, discussion and uh, a lot of uh, good promises coming from big companies, which is very promising, I think.
Yes. I really like your point about the role of the evaluators being to facilitate processes which give, give um, people more equal uh, equal representation. It, one of the things you mentioned was was collaborative forums. Could you talk a bit more about what what's, what practice you, you found in, in that in relation to forums which perhaps include um, members of the public and, and disadvantaged people? Or is it more limited to, say, business and the voluntary sector? Yes, so I'm also always talking about the practices, you know, what, what reports m mention. Yeah. So <clears throat> not talking about actual practice. But what many reports have stressed, the, the setting up, they said they've set up these forums. And in some cases, the reports themselves have been by validated by these forums. So one example is Kenya, where there is a forum which includes stakeholders from civil society, marginalized groups, uh, businesses, and private sector. I believe these are all, you know, uh, good, this is good practice to build on, uh, as long as it doesn't become tokenistic, because I can set up a forum which is not representative. So, you know, I think that's, and that's always the role, I think, of civil society and, and, and the private sector also to say, okay, but, you know, um, how much is representative this forum? Um, also, to me, there is an important element of so addressing the as like evaluation of the SDGs. There is a question mark. How can we assess all the seventeen goals? And to me, it becomes you know. So how do we do this evaluation? I believe that there is a role for different stakeholders and for evaluators to assess the national plan and strategies for sustainable development by looking at the different priorities of each country according to their own trajectory. So for example, in the UK, what should we look at? Uh, in Nepal, does it make look for Nepal to focus on SDG 14, life below water? Now, maybe not. Maybe they should focus more on something else because of course it's not part, you know, a key component of, the, of, of their national sustainable development plan. And also looking at how much you know each country is contributing to the overall achievement of the agenda. So, for example, there is great wastage of resources in developed countries, Italy, UK, you know, the US. So, I think you know by having evaluation can be used for all goals. It, it becomes an impossible exercise. There are no resources, but if we look at the national plans and we identify those that can be seen as the Keystone nodes, the key, you know, building blocks of national development plans of the national theory, let's say, then we can, you know, identify and start using evaluation. I believe that's that could be one way forward. And of course, in doing this exercise, then the question is that you know, different stakeholders have different interests, and hence becomes key the engagement of evaluators to mediate between the different interests. And the engagement of sector experts, of course. Like in Finland, for example, they have set up a group of experts to assess the SDGs. And I think there is a role for, you know, uh, expert uh, uh, in sustainable development. There is a role for different stakeholder groups. And the evaluator's role instead is to facilitate between all of them and say, okay, so what are the priorities? What is key? What are the key dimensions for the UK? What are the key dimensions for Nepal? Going back to the UK example, just to finish on that, you know, I think that if there are a lot of alarming birds around inequalities, I think that should be looked at as soon as possible because that's a key principle of the agenda. And if you know the inequality is, is meant to rise, uh, and you know last year there were forecasts saying around 14 percent, you know, in the next two to three years, uh, you know, got to. I think that's a key element to look at. Yes. Um, uh, Jinsky, UCL, Institute for Sustainable Resources. Um, I'm very pleased with the last comment you made because my question is about how how important is the context, the local context, the culture, not only evaluation culture, but the culture in, in the countries that well, you know, are very diverse, not all of them are democratic, um, and the evaluation as we understand it hinges on certain assumptions about how countries and institutions and companies function which means that uh, addressing um, the, the UN secretariats and trying to come up with sort of universal advice 
uh, may be great, but uh, but as you know, on the ground it will just not work because because, because the reality is different. My question is, what could be an alternative approach? No, can you, can, have you come across an alternative approaches to understanding the, the impact of public intervention you know, on the ground, but following different ways that we do in the, in the Western Hemisphere? You know, is there is there a trend that you you picked um, discussing maybe with people around the world that are trying to do it differently? Adapting to the realities, you know, the, the, the transparency, and the limit, you know, even though we all want it to be transparent, but you know, in the reality, the process will be different. Um, so, what could be an alternative way to just, you know, uh, promoting the classic approach to evaluation of you know, effectiveness, efficiency, and so on? Um, is there an alternative, in your view? Yes, <clears throat> no, it's a great question. So, the first thing. Uh, picking up your last point, like uh, alternative approach to effectiveness, efficiency, which essentially are the, the OECD DAC criteria. So in, in, in the community, in evaluation community, there is great debate around how suitable are these criteria for the SDGs. And, you know, it's a big question mark. I have to say a lot of countries, like, for example, colleagues in Finland said, well, the OECD DAC criteria were so important to set up our evalu evaluation system. But it is true that, for example, in the DAC criteria, sustainability, it's really unclear what it is, for example. Uh, so clearly, <coughs> I think they have to be thought through again. Um, there are different practices. Um, I think there is an in-Africa approach evaluation, which comes from African colleagues, um, pushed by um, the African Evaluation Association, for example. This, you know, urban, I keep uh, mentioning this example because I think it's one of the most important, but this urban example of developing statistics just from the bottom up, um, it's, you know, can have very important, <coughs> um, very, impo very important, uh, uh, can be used, you know, very effectively. There are different practices coming up. Uh, there are, for example, the experiences of the different uh, CLEAR initiatives around the globe, uh, based in different regions. Um, yeah, I think, I think there are some, some alternative approaches, which is, uh, which is uh, comforting, yes. Yes. And then for the balance of care group which is a consultancy which is focusing on health and social care. <clears throat> and coming back to your issue about there's an awful lot of data and turning it into information and having indicators but yet trying to look at several different goals simultaneously and on how do you sort of make links across things. <clears throat> it brings to mind some work which was carried out in the Department of Health uh, actually at the end of the last century um, <laughs> which may have sort of a resonance or, 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 or be of, of, of interest to you. And there, the <clears throat> health service here introduced an awful lot of management indicators in the health service. Started at 400, mushrooms to several thousand at one <laughs> stage as well. Oh. And of course, the answer is you've got all this in, you've got all this data, but how does anybody make sense of it? And particularly in the department at the time, which was interested in the National Health Service, um, they were trying to say, well, what's the messages coming from different parts of the country? Now, one of the ways they approached that was to um, develop some called at the time expert systems, very fledgling AI, you might say, or something like that. The point there was that they tried to look at what are the objectives, what is it we're trying to find out about what sort of goals are being met. For example, about bed occupancy or bed usage or theatres or something like that. And are there areas which might be working at this better than others? How do we look at that? And sort of roughly speaking, the way they came about it was to, to get some expert groups together <clears throat> in different sectors of the health uh, field and say, okay, if we've got this range of indicators, how, how do they work as a narrative to address the particular issue we're looking at? So it was then a, a rule-based system was, was put in. So then you could feed data in, uh, and for example, if you're looking at health efficiency, use of beds, for example. You might want something about the number of beds, you might want something about turnover intervals, occupancy, various things like that. So bringing those indicators together, and if you know, an indicator is high in one thing and low in another, and low in the third one, it might actually have a message which is it's starting to tell you. And the expert group was sort of set up the rules for that, 
and then you could actually you know, get uh, quite a quick and uh, effective um, initial evaluations from a lot of data quite, quite simply. And I wonder the extent to which that kind of approach and much more advanced rule-based systems and things like that these days might help you interpret the data in ways which is not just looking at the numbers, but trying to pull it together into narrative, which would perhaps cross uh, several of the SDG. Yes. No, no, this is a fantastic example, and I think, you know, I think it, it may relate to the level of confidence that, you know, we, we can never make, we can never have 100% level of confidence in data. But we believe that the more data we produce, the more confident we can be, which is not the case. It is about understanding, you know, and, and uh, being able to live with a level of confidence which is lower than 100%, and uh, using different type of information which allow you to, you know, decrease or increase. So I'm thinking, for example, the whole thing around uh, frequencies versus Bayesian statistics and the importance of, you know, using statistics differently, for example. Uh, but also, <clears throat> yes, it is, you know, there are effective ways. Also, to me, it goes back to theory. So, for example, like, what's, what's the theory? How do systems work? How, what's the theory behind um, a certain type of intervention? Does the theory work? For example, what do different experts or experts can also be communities. So communities yeah. themselves can be experts. So what are you know those experiencing, those that have more knowledge about something, saying about how a system works. But I think like a lot of this to me goes back, sorry, maybe it's a bit convoluted by answer, but all I'm trying to say is that it's a holistic assessment which we need to do. It's not just picking you know one thing. You know, one specific target because we could have great economic growth and the world collapses because of that if we don't look at the internet which is you know it's common sense um, but is how we have evolved probably <laughs> until now got time for about one more question yeah. um, have you come across the use of uh, it's an exam-set evaluation. Because it, it's, I mean, I understand you looked at the, the, the report with the VNRs, but my, my curiosity is to what extent evaluation was used also in, in programming, so already translating the priorities and the national funds into specific policy instruments, and whether evaluation starts linking to, you know, thinking prospectively. So, so you mentioned you, you mentioned the roadmap in Kenya. I, I wonder come across similar ex examples as well. Well, extent evaluation, not so many in terms of, yes, in Kenya, they, were, like, they did an assessment of the MDGs to see how it could inform the SDGs. They did it, I think, in Ethiopia. I think I didn't mention, but I believe also in Nigeria, if I remember well. Um, <clears throat> so in a few countries, they did it. Interestingly, all countries, all developing countries, of course, because they had to you know, report on the MDGs. Um, Basically, all countries are doing gap assessment, but it's more of a statistical exercise to see which data are we missing. And uh, yes, so I think you know my, my um, so not many, not many examples until now.